Hey folks, Gil here. Before we get into this episode with Lord DIY, I want to give a trigger warning that this interview includes discussions of seizures and emetophobia, which is a fear of vomiting, and might be disturbing to some. All right, let's do this. His name is Gil. My name is Gil Kruger, and in this show, I go deep with content creators on their struggles with mental health. On this season of Mentally Gil, we're focusing on anxiety and burnout. This week, Lauren Riamaki, whom you may know as Lord DIY, enters the chat. We talk about a traumatic experience she had in high school, her fear of getting sick, and her support system. Hi, I'm Lauren Riamaki, otherwise known as Lord DIY Online. I'm an online content creator. I am a podcast host, and I also host Craftopia on HBO Max. Lauren was early to the YouTube game and has cultivated an audience of over 20 million followers on social media who love her DIY and lifestyle content. How and when did her anxiety manifest? Let's start with some maple-scented backstory. Tell me about where you grew up and what your parents did. So I grew up in Canada, so uh, about an hour away from Toronto. Very, like, regular size suburban town. And it was pretty normal. Like my parents are still together. I'm an only child. And so my childhood is pretty like, I don't say picturesque, but like I definitely didn't experience trauma until much later in life. <laughs> but I, I had a I had a great childhood. Like my parents and I are still super, super close. Um, and I was a pretty well-rounded kid. Did either of them have like creative professions or is this like completely new? So my mom was a director of a home healthcare management company. So like in the public healthcare sector. And then my dad worked 30 years at General Motors. Um, and then he's a mailman now just as like a, as like a part time, like social activity. There wasn't really like an art type of thing flowing through my family in terms of professions. I would say my dad and I are probably the most similar. He's always always been a big car guy. So he will take apart his car just to put it back together. And so he's very handy in that sense. And so I'm sure there's something there, you know, that connects what I do in like DIY and what he does with um, like tinkering with things and being able to fix basically anything. Lauren attributes the catalyst behind her anxiety to her senior year of high school, although she would come to realize it started earlier. Looking back, I can see little traces of anxiety as a child, but it didn't affect me in the sense that like I was aware of it and not wanting to like do things like I, there was no like avoidance of any activity or whatever when I was a kid. But I can think of like having skin picking issues and stuff when I was standing out in the baseball field as like a kid picking out my hands for whatever reason. You know, it's like looking back, I can identify at those moments of like having traces of anxiety. But I think it wasn't until that last year in high school when Lauren was a senior in high school, her boyfriend at the time started to show signs of epilepsy. It was a scary time for both of them. Lauren did her best to support him, but her life was going through massive changes as well. She was about to start college at Ryerson University and move out from her parents' house. There's one day that sticks out to her. So before you have a seizure, a lot of the times uh, people have epilepsy will have something called an aura and it can be, it can vary depending on like who the person is, but a lot of the times it's like the, the pre-seizure symptoms. And so his specifically were like a feeling of like roller coaster in your stomach and overheating and a metallic taste in the mouth. And so kind of in the months leading up to that very first seizure, he had days where he would have a ton of auras, but it never ended up resulting in a seizure. So after every hospital visit and doctor check-in, they kind of were just like, well, if you haven't had a seizure, like we can't put you on anti-seizure medications. So that was still part of kind of like our day-to-day -day as a couple. It was just that like him having auras and like sometimes like going to ER, just if it was like a really bad day, just in case they would tell us something different or something really bad happened. I think on this particular day, he woke up feeling really weird, like something was off that he felt on the day of. And it was a weekend. So his family situation was not great at the time. And so like I 
felt the responsibility of kind of being that primary kind of support in his life. Um, and so anyway, so I picked him up from his house. We went back to my parents' house where I was obviously still living because I was in high school. And we were home alone. He, we like had something to eat for lunch. And then um, we like laid down to take a nap. And because brains can be so active while you're sleeping. Um, a lot of times he would wake up from sleep um, abruptly and be having an aura. And so that happened this time as well. He went to the bathroom because for whatever reason, the initial reaction to like the metal taste would be to spit it out because I think probably it's not very enjoyable. And so he was in the bathroom doing that. And I had obviously woken up because like he had woken up. This is like one of the, uh, for sure is like now an audio related trigger for me now too that I think is something that's hard to kind of forget and escape but the sounds that are associated with a seizure are almost worse than actually watching the seizure happen itself because like you're not getting air right and so the choking sounds that go along with it are fucking terrifying and so I heard that before I saw the seizure so ran to the bathroom he was on the floor in the bathroom heard the seizure before I saw it and I was able to just like kind of get his head away from anything um hard and I grabbed a towel down from the towel rack to like put it under his head called in when it was happening like it, it's one of those moments where you look back and it's like I was on autopilot in the sense of like like getting help, but also in the highest state of like mania that I'd ever been in all kind of happening all at once. And so in that moment, I think that was maybe the one of the first times that I experienced like what felt like total loss of control. So being totally helpless in watching a seizure happen, like there's really nothing you can do except for kind of wait it out. And um, a lot of the times people will start a timer because there's like kind of like certain time increments that have higher risks when it's, it's, it's lack of oxygen to the brain, right? When you're having a seizure. Following the seizure, um, like kind of like the part two of that is that he went into, they him into a coma for four days because they couldn't stop the seizure from happening. So again, that's like another extended period of just like not knowing what the outcome is going to be and just feeling totally useless in the situation and just like waiting to see what happens next. And so when that period kind of finished, it was all like everyone breathes a sigh of relief, you know, family kind of disperses, everything goes back to normal. But I didn't take the time to like really process like how that would affect me, I guess, in that situation. Because obviously, like, in my mind, like, I was so far from being the priority of, like, what was important at that time in terms of, like, health. And obviously, mental health is so important. But, like, in that moment, it was, like, at the bottom of my list of priorities. And so I think it was just, like, a shock to my system and something that I hadn't experienced before triggered something in my brain to kind of send me over the edge of, like, now having this whole new perspective on like what my anxiety disorder was going to look like and kind of where I think it started to the point that it was really, really affecting what my life looked like on a daily basis. Lauren graduated from high school and enrolled at Ryerson University in Toronto to major in graphic communications management, which apparently has to do with commercial printing. It was a difficult transition for her. Does the fear of, of loss of control, did that fear sort of carry with you into like going to school at Ryerson? And, and what was that transitional period like for you? Transitional period was, I would say, rocky, for sure. I had lived in the same house my entire life. So I'd never even had like a transitional practice round of like moving living spaces because I, I had been in the same house since I was born. And so I had a great group of girls that I was living on the same floor. I was in um, like the school residence. Um, and so I was living in like what was called apartment style. So we all had our own rooms, but it was four girls, kind of an apartment. There was other people living on the floor. And so like I had a pretty positive experience in terms of like meeting new people. And I don't struggle with social anxiety as much as I do just like battling myself in my own head. Outside of that, like the actual like classes. Like I didn't like my program. I didn't like my classes, but I had good people around me. I think that's when my anxiety started manifesting in like a bit of agoraphobia where I had trouble at some points, like leaving my dorm room without feeling like I was just like so fight or flight. I like, could not like get down the hallway to like go do something or to like go to the mall down the street or, you know, go out with friends. And so that's the first time that I really created like the safe space of like what that would be, what that would look like. And it was like my dorm room. And then like 
the not safe space of anywhere that wasn't my dorm room and having to kind of figure out how to navigate that because I would instantly feel sick. I don't exactly know like how this link kind of formed. I have like a specific phobia of throwing up. Um, it's called emetophobia. And so I think because, and this is kind of like what I've worked through through therapy is that like sometimes this just like is a random connection that just happens to associate itself together is that like when someone throws up, it's typically, you know, like you don't really control it. But for the most part, like if you're going to be sick, you are going to be sick. And that's kind of like a moment where you are not in control. So anytime that I felt slightly sick or sick to my stomach, or I was faced with something that could make me sick, like for example, I would never eat like raw fish because of how often people get food poisoning from it, or like some kind of spinny ride or something in an amusement park, like that's also associated with like a higher risk of getting sick. And so I think that's when that link started to like really form and take a hold of just like a lot of what I was doing in life. Okay, with all this talk of getting sick and throwing up, I just have to vomit out one millennial pop culture reference, and then we can continue. If you're going to spew, spew into this. Okay, thanks. Now it's out of my system. Anyway, while Lauren was in college, she had her first panic attack. And it was during an exam. So one of my first panic attacks where to me it felt like it came out of nowhere like looking back definitely was just like in a room full of stressed university students taking their first ever exam in a sea of 3,000 kids I just was so not familiar with any of the sensations of what a panic attack feels like so I was sitting in this exam I suddenly I think the fight or flight was the very first thing that kind of hit me where it's like I couldn't focus I couldn't read what was in front of me I was like obsessed with like where the door was and like like my options for exiting, which you don't really have that many options for exiting when you're writing like a a finals (laughs) exam. Like you don't really have an option. Like your option is like fail the exam and exit or like do the exam and hopefully not fail and then exit. And so like I was able to get through the exam, but I I, like out of those 3000 kids, like I was the first one out the door, luckily passed. Um, I I feel like I probably was just like, you know, circling like A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D in the multiple choice answers (laughs) um, because my my priority was getting the fuck out of that room. And so it was just like the fight or flight. It was the tunnel vision. It was like I couldn't catch my breath, like feeling just like so like tight in like the throat area. And like the sweating, but it was just like, I mean, there's no better way to describe it than just like the literal panic that I was feeling in that moment that to me felt like it came out of nowhere. And it felt like, I was like, why is this happening? Like, it just felt like betrayal from my body. I was like, what the fuck? I've studied so hard for this exam. And like, I'm going to walk in here and you're going to do this to me right now and like jeopardize all of this. It's like the biggest what the fuck moment ever because it's such a strong sensation that you are now experiencing for the first time. And you might not necessarily know what the trigger was. And just overall, it's just like a lot to take in while also trying to maintain a passing grade on the exam. Around this time, did you decide to seek advice from a professional about what you were feeling? I think in first university, when I was really, really struggling with just like even leaving my dorm room and, you know, just uh, having trouble, it was being disruptive to make my day-to-day life. And so that's the first time that I spoke to a therapist. I tried some phone therapy, didn't love that. I spoke to some people in person. The first girl that I talked to in person, she basically was like, do you see your life without anxiety? And like being in the peak of my anxiety, I was like, no, like I can't envision that. Like what a fucking stupid question. And then she was like, okay, well you should probably be on medication. And I was like, that is so helpful. Like, thank you so much. Like this is not quite your job as a therapist. And so didn't see her again. And I saw a few other people after that, that I think probably helped lay the foundation of learning what anxiety is. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the birth of your blog and your channel and if there was any sort of connection to like your anxiety. So as I was kind of navigating my first year of university, I very quickly realized that I was 
potentially not in the right program. What I thought was going to be something that was like very creative driven ended up being a very stuffy printing focused program. So in my first year, I was just like desperate for something that kind of was just more creative. And I started a blog first because I was in a new city. I was like, oh, I'm going on like new adventures. Like, let me take some photos. I'd always been interested in like taking pictures. And I'm by no means like a strong writer. Like I'm fine at writing, but I'm not like a creative writer by any means. And so blogging wasn't really for me. But I started like doing some little DIY tutorials, right? Because like I'd love going to like bead stores and stuff like that. And, you know, throwing things together, whatever it might be, nothing crazy. The blog was called, (laughs) get ready for this, Desire and inspire. Yeah. And so eventually I was like, oh, well, like this makes more sense to show a tutorial via video. And so I started making YouTube videos for the purpose of embedding them into this blog that I had started, um, not really knowing that YouTube was its own ecosystem within itself, that you, you know, had all these creators and comments and these these fan bases that were subscribers. And so eventually when I transitioned over, um, it just made so much sense and everything clicked and I was obsessed immediately. And I got so involved in like, as a viewer watching other YouTubers, And so that was kind of the start of like where the content creation part of it was. I don't necessarily think that there's like a a really strong link to kind of my mental health journey in terms of like, I wasn't going into being like, oh, this is going to fix my anxiety. But I definitely think having that creative outlet and having something that was motivating and exciting, something positive was probably something that was a helpful and healthy distraction from getting too caught up in like the spiral that was my mental health also happening on like the back end of everything in my brain. Even though Lauren had found a creative outlet and an online community on YouTube, her anxiety and panic attacks took on an even more intense physical form in her last year of college. I was working on my visa, I was in a long distance relationship, and there was a lot of transitional elements happening in my life. And I was having kind of just like, it was a panic attack that felt like it lasted a long time where you very much like hit a peak and then you eventually come down where my spine went numb and like the back of my neck went numb and so like Obviously, like that raised many, many red flags. So I took myself to ER because I was like, I should probably, you know, just make sure, just make sure. Because any kind of numbness in your body is typically not a great sign. (laughs) And also the healthcare system in Canada is much more affordable than it is in the States. So there was there was no issue of like, oh, like, is there some kind of like hurdle for me to like go seek healthcare just in case it is something. Again, like they took all my vitals and I was fine. And eventually a couple hours later too, like it subsided because obviously I was like mentally calming down as well too but I think the first time that that happened it definitely was like a massive shock though Lauren was dealing with intense panic attacks she was becoming quite popular on YouTube by 2014 she passed a million subscribers other opportunities would follow but Lauren continued to deal with anxiety when you were sort of coming up in the content creation world like was your anxiety at bay? Was it sort of rearing its ugly head around certain things? I mean, what was that like for your mental well-being? So putting myself out there kind of on the internet is not something that I've really struggled with. Again, like the social anxiety portion of it, I don't, I don't think about too, too much. I would say it's not easy being on the internet and getting potentially shit on by many, many strangers. Um, like, you know, that's not super like fun for anyone who's a creator on the internet. But I think also too, like, I I think about some creators who start doing this at like 15 and 16, like, and I can't even imagine how hard it is to kind of grow up in the spotlight online being a creator. But I was a little bit older by the time I had like a bigger audience. I was 21, 22. And not that like, you know exactly who you are at 21, 22, but like I had a much better idea of who I was like at my core and like my values and like the foundation of myself as like a human and like what I believe in and what I love and like, you know what I mean? Like who I am generally. So I think like, that portion of it didn't send me into any kind of spiral of like being kind of like thrust into the spotlight and being, you know, a little more public with just like my life in general. And I think too, having a lot of incredible opportunities in terms of travel and being invited to things and like going out to LA for my first time, I think kind of force me to get out of my comfort zone. Because I think had I not been doing this, like maybe I would have stayed in Toronto and, you know, found some kind of nine to five and be living, you know, a fine life, maybe like a little boring, like who knows. But because I had worked so hard to kind of 
build and like create a brand and like work so hard at being consistent and making content, I felt like I owed it to myself to do and like say yes to all these opportunities that were, you know, being offered to me because I had worked so hard. So like, what, like, I'm like, okay, you're going to bust ass and you want to do cool things. And now you're being offered to do cool things. Like, how could you possibly say no to this? And obviously like, it was finding the balance between like what to say yes to and what to say no to, because I was like still a university student um, and balancing, you know, a lot of other things. But I think it forced me to get out of my comfort zone in terms of like, I worked so hard and I've earned this. And so now I should go forward and like do it. Let's go to an ad break because making this show ain't free. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Tell me if this has happened to you before. You encounter a roadblock in life. Maybe you had a disagreement with someone at work and you freeze. It's like someone's flashed a light in your eyes. You become so overwhelmed that you can't even think about a solution. Therapy has allowed me to become a better problem solver because it lets me put distance between myself and the problem so that I can focus on solutions. It has been critical to helping me accomplish my goals, big and small. Over the years, therapy has helped me process trauma, lower my stress and anxiety levels, and ultimately be more confident. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. BetterHelp solves one of the biggest pain points I had in starting therapy, which is finding a therapist in the first place. In the past, I had to manually set up appointments and meet with various practitioners until I found a match. It was like speed dating. Nobody likes speed dating. With BetterHelp, you can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey. You can specify if you want someone from a particular background, like from the LGBTQ plus community, for example. And if the vibe isn't right, you can switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash gill today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash gill. Betterhelp.com slash gill. How would you describe your anxiety these days? My anxiety is probably ever present. And it's something that has been a huge part of my life and something that I have to consistently manage and work at. It's a continual process, I think, of coping mechanisms and finding balance. But it's definitely you know, a big part of my day every single day in a way that not necessarily is always super negative, but it's just like such a big part of who I am. There doesn't go a day where I don't think about something related to it or a coping mechanism or doing a coping mechanism to, you know, help uh, manage symptoms of anxiety or just manage any kind of tension or stress that could lead to further anxiety. I love how you described it on your podcast where you said it's like, Something like there's it's a horror movie soundtrack. Can you talk more about that? Like my dad is someone who's never experienced a day of anxiety of his entire life. And so when I was like helping him to understand like the mental health process of like anxiety versus stress and anxiety versus nerves and nerves versus stress. And like, obviously there's a lot of overlap there, but like being anxious. And I always refer to this one like analogy is that he was always confused how he could get up in a room of 5,000 people and deliver like some kind of public speaking thing. But the idea of going to Disneyland for the day and like the fear of getting sick that day would be so much stronger of an anxious feeling than public speaking in front of 5,000 people. And so I think when it comes to the horror movie thing, I think my boyfriend made that reference. But like, I just envision my dad not having like the soundtrack to his life is probably like, you know, pretty positive, pretty happy, you know, might have some like action moments or whatever of like soundtrack. But I think for a lot of my life, there's like maybe like a building, a building soundtrack of like, because I wouldn't say it's always horror. Like that feels really negative to be like, oh, like I have the soundtrack of a horror movie behind my life because that's not at all what it is. But it definitely gives you that feeling when you're watching a horror movie and you know something's gonna happen. You feel like a little bit on edge and you feel like your brain is multitasking, thinking about whatever like the like the uneasy feeling is while also thinking about whatever's like actually happening in the present. Physically, 
What does anxiety feel like to you? I think when I'm like mildly anxious, it's like increased heart rate. I have trouble focusing. There's a lot of kind of like disruptive thoughts, like intrusive thoughts. I I would say my stomach is very connected to anxiety in terms of like having to go to the bathroom more often or feeling nauseous or like uh, I feel a lot of anxiety in my throat for whatever reason. And so it's like, like feeling very tense and like I hyper focus on like how my swallowing feels. You know, so it's like, it's like very weird things, but it, it's such a strong mind body connection that I like know is so, so, so real. And then I think during an actual panic attack, it's a lot of that, but just like times a thousand where it's like very much tunnel vision. It's like the fight or flight feeling. It's overheating and your heart is just racing. It's sweaty palms. It's sometimes hyperventilating, sometimes sobbing. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's been, you know, it's like, I think you experience a variety of different symptoms depending on what the situation is. Yeah. You've talked like about how you have like a kit with you. When I think about anxiety and like how I approach it and like coping mechanisms, I think one of the ways that I help myself to feel like I'm adding an element of control to my life is like having a little like people, you know, always refer to like their coping mechanisms as their toolkit. But this is like my literal physical toolkit. So like having Pepto, if I feel like and like I try and like not take Pepto if like something feels a little bit off. I'm like, okay, like, am I actually sick? And I've come a long way in terms of like being able to like actually identify whether like something is actually wrong or like it's my mind making me feel sick. But like having Pepto, having um, so I have a Xanax prescription that I luckily rarely have to take. But that's kind of like the 911 button where it's like if if something if I'm having a panic attack, but it's stuff like that that I think has helped give me a sense of control. In addition to like the choking sound, what are some of your other like anxiety triggers? Planes was definitely one that I had to tackle. I live across the continent from my family. They're still over in like Niagara Falls, Toronto area in Canada. And there was a point, you know, where I was traveling a lot for work and, you know, you have to go to New York, you have to go to other cities. And like looking back a couple of years ago, there's no way that I could have like mentally managed to do all those things. So travel, I think, was one of like the biggest triggers for me because the thought of getting sick with like zero option to go home. And it's not always necessarily like home as in like my exact residence here, like where I'm recording this from. Right. It's like whatever the safe space that like I've established. So whether that be the hotel where I'm somewhere or the Airbnb that I'm saying. So it's not necessarily like a specific place. It's more like wherever I've like established in my head when I get somewhere is like the safe space. But I think one of like the places where it's easiest to feel trapped, and I know a lot of people have just like general travel anxiety is like on a plane. Like if I'm not able to establish somewhere as like, you know, your little safe space on a plane, like you're essentially trapped in that seat until you land. You have no options for the fight or flight feeling of exiting somewhere because there's nowhere to go. So it's the fear of getting sick trapped in a metal tube. It's not about crashing. No. Oh my God. Turbulence, like throw it at me, like whatever. Do I love and enjoy turbulence? Like, no, obviously not. Like it's, you know, everyone's like, is this the time where it's like the movies? But like turbulence is not something that I think about prior to a flight to be like, oh, is this going to be a rocky flight? But like, do I think about how I feel the night before? Do I think about like how I feel the morning of to make sure like I'm not feeling sick? Or like, am I thinking about like what should I eat that day that's going to ensure that like, it's not like something new to my body that might make me sick. It's like something that would go through my mind for the entire day and days leading up to travel. And like, I think I needed to like have panic attacks on plane as well too, to like get past the fear of just like having a panic attack on a plane. Like, obviously that's not the most ideal scenario is that like you have to do it to like experience it, to like get past it. But I've definitely come a long, long way in terms of like it not being as disruptive in my life. In your day-to-day life or when things get particularly rough, how do you talk to yourself? Um, I mean, again, I have I feel like I've got 10 years under my belt now of like learning my triggers and knowing how my body is, for the most part, going to react to a lot of different scenarios. So I think mentally prepping and trying to just be as conscious as I can about anxiety. Because I think like knowing that high periods of stress were a trigger for me, I would try and just not think about anything anxiety related and just like focus on getting through it. So for example, when we shot the uh, HBO show Craftopia, like those were super long days. They were like, you know, 16, 
16, 17 hours of just like physically grueling. And so obviously mentally tolling as well too. And so during um, when we were shooting, I would just focus on getting through it, like getting through it, just like get through it, just get through it this many more days, this many more days. And obviously it was an incredible experience. I had so much fun on set, but like mentally I knew that like at the end of that, I was going to have a massive crash and I'm pretty good at kind of trucking through what needs to get done. Similar to that exam on my very first panic attack, like just force myself all, like, you know, all the way through. It. And then afterwards, like everything comes crashing down. And so I think that's how I approached um, a lot of stressful situations in the past. But now I'm trying to be more proactive and conscious and kind of like deal with anxious thoughts as they come rather than trying to stop them in the back corner and deal with them when they become too big and force themselves in after I kind of like take that sigh of relief after, you know, a period of stressful times. So I just, for example, the last three weekends, I've been back to back to back traveling and on planes and different, in different places, but also working normally like a year ago, there's no pos. I don't even know if I would have survived one trip, you know, without like mentally breaking down. There's times where you have to be just really nice to yourself if you're not having a good week or month or day or whatever it is. And just knowing that like, this is part of you, you know what I mean? Like your mental health is a part of you and you can't neglect it. And sometimes like, it's okay to have a shitty day and just be like, yeah, I had a shitty day. And how much stronger I think the things that I've learned in therapy are too. Like, cause like the more you implement them if within like your toolkit as coping mechanisms, like the stronger they get with the more practice that you have using them. And so I think it's always been really important for me to, to recognize that too. And just be like, wow, like, fuck yeah. Like this has been such a good, like last chunk period of time. Like I can't remember the last time that I had like a bad day. And that's like really, really cool to think about. And then I caught like a wicked cold after Coachella and I'm like, I was on my deathbed, but like, it doesn't make me anxious. I just, my body, my, mentally I was still good, but physically my body tapped out. <laughs> Do you still to this day like have negative self-talk? Yeah, I mean, I think negative self-talk is is nearly impossible. I commend the shit out of anyone who can get through their life without having moments of negative self-talk. Because I mean, like no one wants to have anxiety. No one wants to have depression. Like that's not something that you and I have worked really hard to make this be something that's not disruptive and something that doesn't have to be so negative. But I mean, I think it's nearly impossible to not have days where you're like, this fucking sucks. Like, why me? Like, how, like, why did this have to happen to me or whatever? Do you ever feel like a lump in your stomach when you're about to upload a video? No, <laughs> no. no, I think uploading videos is one of those things where I'm like, eh, whatever. I, I just feel like there's, there's so many creators now and I've been doing it for so long and not to say that like I'm jaded or like, it's just like, it's just part of, I think, my life. I've uploaded so many videos at this point. Like maybe there have been some videos where I've worked really hard and I hope that they do well and are like received well and people are excited about the content because I'm personally excited about it and invested a lot of like TLC into it. But for the most part, in terms of like anxiety, I've never really like hovered over the upload button to be nervous or anxious about it. Have you ever been burned out? Oh my God. I would say like on a quarterly basis, I burn out. I mean, I, th I think it's hard. And I think a lot of creators probably experience this too, is that there's so many platforms now and there's so much content that's being made and so many con so much content that you could be making 24 hours a day. People are just consuming at all times. Like that sometimes it's hard to not get caught up in like what you could be doing. It's, you know, finding the balance and like finding your priorities of like what you want to be making and also what your audience is excited about and ultimately like what you're excited about for your brand. But yeah, and I think also too, like being on the internet for so long, for 10 years, it's like, it's been a game of finding new ways to evolve and recreating kind of like what the content is to stay exciting and to stay engaged with my audience too. It's like you who have to consistently be kind of keeping up with what's going on and finding new ways to create content that is going to make you happy as a creator. Like you don't want to be doing this for 10 years and hate your life and hate the content that you are making. It's a cycle for sure. What's like your support system look like now? You know, like who are the people that are in your life, therapists, relationships? Support system right now is great. And it, it really always has been. Like I, I could not have had more supportive parents. My boyfriend currently is so incredibly understanding and supportive and is open to learning and hearing feedback on how he can support me and being proactive in thinking ahead and how a situation might trigger my anxiety. In terms of friends, I've got incredible friends who are aware of my anxiety and are there 
there in any way that I need them to be. But then I also have amazing friends like Kelsey Darrow, who has experienced anxiety and that she knows what I'm talking about exactly. Because I think I have friends who I'm like, I just had like a really bad panic attack. And they're like, oh my God, like, are you okay? And like, they mean that. They truly want to know if I'm okay. But if they've never experienced it, it's hard to explain the severity of like what that can do to you like and how mentally tolling that could be and like why you might need to like take a few days like away from everything I think it's nice to have a balance of friends who are there to just like love you and support you and you know are there and however you need but then also friends who can relate to what you've been through and understand what you're doing and then family same thing like my mom I think is wired similarly to me and so she's always said that like if something like that initial seizure had happened to her like maybe her brain could have you know misfired and wired the same way as mine and she could have ended up with a severe anxiety disorder and so she I think is always open to learning more and also has been really great in learning how to support someone because that's also the hardest part sometimes too is like being on the other side of that because like having a panic attack or having an anxiety disorder it's like you don't always need the same thing which like I can't imagine how fucking frustrating that is for like my boyfriend and my mom and my best friends and stuff like that like there isn't like a step one two three on how to be there as a support system and so I think everyone has done a really great job in my life in taking feedback you know trying to take follow my lead on what I might need on that specific time. And then on the medication front, I was on an SSRI for about nine years and I had gone up to kind of the max dose that my doctor was like, okay, like maybe it's time to try something new if you feel like it's not quite, you know, serving you in the way that you want it to or the way that it used to, like maybe we try something else. And so I came off of that and tried a different approach that was ironically actually an approach that sometimes seizure patients will use to help bring down the level of like overactivity in your brain, which was so wildly ironic that it's like such a full circle moment. So it was in conjunction with something that would help like lower your, not like lower your heart rate, but, um, I guess basically like a blood pressure medication in conjunction with something that would like lower your overall brain activity. I think my brain activity was a little too high for this method. And so this was like really not, not it for me. And so I really, really had a hard time last spring, like between like January, February to March is when I was like transitioning meds for like coming off of the SSRI, which had like some pretty wild withdrawal symptoms and trying something new. And, you know, like when you try a new medication, they want you to stay on it for like three to six months to like see if it like is actually effective. And so like that three to six month period was like the worst period of my entire life. Like it was rough. Like I was incapable. I was living probably at like 15% capacity of like what I'm living at now, maybe even less. Like it was not a functional period of time. And luckily the silver lining is that we weren't really allowed to leave our houses. So it was the most ideal time, I guess, for me to mentally not be able to leave my house either. Past that, once I kind of was able to like try something new and I got onto an SNRI called Effexor, Effexor, E-F-F-O-X-O-R. And that medication changed my fucking life. It gave me my life back. And obviously I was doing therapy for the entire year as well too. So like, I don't want to discredit the work that I was doing mentally in terms of like working through the CBT stuff with my therapist. But I think having my levels balanced out in my brain can just play such a massive part in it. And like, that's what I always try and tell people when someone's going through mental health stuff is that like, sometimes it chemically can just be a literal imbalance that has nothing to do with anything that happened to you or like what you've been through. And it's like, sometimes it literally is just like scientifically things are out of whack and you just have to find the right medication that helps bring you back to normal levels while doing therapy, obviously too, in conjunction to like help you manage a lot of the other stuff. But yeah, the medication really, really was a big part for me that brought me to like my lowest low and then my highest high. But I would say that like I didn't have like a life changing therapist until this past year. And so he specialized in cognitive behavioral therapy, um, CBT. And I cannot even tell you how much he has changed my life and being able to rewire a lot of the ways that I think about things and the ways that I can deescalate a situation by the way that we've rewired my thinking and how I approach different things or like approach a trigger. But I've, I've tried a lot of it. I've tried EMDR with the little vibrating things that you hold in your hands. 
that didn't quite connect for me. I've tried, I think it's a different version of EMDR where your eyes are going back and forth to different sides of your head. That one didn't quite connect with me. I also tried hypnotherapy. That sent me into a a panic attack in itself because being hypnotized, you're giving up control of like your body and your brain. And so when I could feel myself drifting into a different kind of like mental state, it sent me into a panic. And so I was like, this probably isn't for me either. But I think, you know, it's a learning experience. And like, I don't regret going into any of those therapists. I'm sure from each of them, I've learned something, even if it's just like learning what EMDR is and learning what works and what doesn't work and like learning different foundations and creating different links to like things that have happened in my life. But I would say CBT is hands down like what changed everything for me in terms of like how therapy can be used to mitigate everything anxiety related in my life. When you were having like the lowest of the lows with, you know, going off the meds, what was your creative output like? I think creatively I was managing because I didn't have to leave home for the creation part. And, you know, I think that was the biggest part of it is like leaving the house was the hardest part. Even if I did a workout in the morning and I felt like a little bit sick after because maybe I'd push myself too hard, like that would send me out of commission for the entire day because I'd spiral about like how I felt in the morning and how I had that like twinge of sickness in the morning. But I think creatively, Creative wise, probably similar to my first year in university, was able to use it as like a healthy, positive distraction. I wouldn't say that it it like affected like my output in any way drastically in terms of like the content that I was creating or like being less creative or more creative. I would say I definitely probably wasn't an asset in any way, but um, it wasn't something that I think really, really affected what I was doing because we had to create from home. Does having the anxiety that you have, like, do you ever consider it in some way like a superpower? <laughs> a superpower? No, I would definitely I wish that I could say yes to this. I would say that it has led to positive things in terms of being able to be an advocate for it and help normalize the conversation, but I wouldn't wish this on anyone. I wouldn't want to give this to someone else, but I think it has come with a lot of benefits in terms of like the educational purposes and having a platform and being able to use my platform to talk about things like this. And that was Lauren Riamaki. I didn't know what emetophobia was before talking with Lauren, but it tracks perfectly with the anxiety of not being in control. You can find Lauren on all the major platforms as Laura DIY. She's the host of Craftopia on HBO Max, and she has a podcast called Wild Till Nine with her partner, Jeremy Lewis. Make sure to subscribe to Mentally Gill wherever you subject yourself to it. And if you want unlimited gilly points, leave a five-star review. Until next time, be kind to yourself. His name is Gil. Mentally Gill is executive produced and hosted by me, Gil Kruger. Executive produced by Zach Stewart Pontier. Produced and edited by Melissa D. Mons and Diane Kang of Diamond Emprint Productions. Post production sound by Chris Henry. Theme song and ad break music by Austin Archer. This has been a Best Regards Media production. 